قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode of Ask Zad coming to you every Saturday between Maghrib and Isha in Mecca region time Our first question from the emails as usual uh, we will take three questions, insha'Allah, and then we will take your live uh, uh, calls. What is the ruling on being 45 degrees off from the Qibla? What is the Qibla? The Qibla is the direction of the Kaaba. What is the Kaaba? It's the black uh, uh, structure found in Mecca in the sacred masjid Al-Haram, in Masjid Al-Haram, where all Muslims, when they pray five times a day, they face. Whether they're in China, in the U.S., in Europe, in the Middle East, no matter where they are, it's an obligation. It's one of the conditions for accepting their prayers that they face the direction of the Qibla. And it's a sign of unity. And the Muslims don't worship, of course, this structure because it's made of stones. And we rise and climb on top of it and walk all over it with our feet without any problem. But it is a symbolic struct structure that was originally built by Adam, peace be upon him, and then uh, uh, renovated and rebuilt again by Ibrahim, peace be upon him, and Prophet Ismail, peace be upon him as well. And it's been there since the beginning of time. And even when we bury our dead, if you go to Muslim cemeteries, you'll find that the corpse of a Muslim deceased is laid in the grave, lying on its right side, facing the direction of the Qibla. So it is our Qibla to be directed to when we are alive and also after our death. So the question again, is it okay to be diverted 45 degrees off from the Qibla? This is an issue that was answered by the Prophet ﷺ. As you know, Medina is up north of Mecca. So when the people of Medina want to pray, they're obliged to face the south. This is where Mecca is. So they asked the Prophet ﷺ once about this diversion in direction. And the Prophet said ﷺ, what's between the east and the west is Qibla. So now you're talking about this variation. The Prophet says it's a Qibla. So as long as you are, if your Qibla is to your south, as in the case uh, of the people of Medina, if you're facing east or west or north, your prayer is invalid. But if you're facing the direction, though there's a yeah, any small uh, negligible diversion, that would be accepted. And the scholars say, if you are inside of the masjid, inside of Al-Haram, the sanctuary, and you can see the Qibla, you can see the Kaaba, you must be in its direction face to face. So if the Qibla is there and you go a little bit to the left or the right, your prayer is invalid because you can see it. So no matter where you are in the masjid, you have to 
be in the same exact direction of the Qibla. And if you're in Mecca, but not inside the masjid itself, so the whole masjid is your Qibla. And if you're outside of Mecca city, now the circle is way bigger, so the deviation is possible. Scholars say that the direction is what you have to be facing not the exact masjid because it's almost impossible to know exactly where it is so the direction with little deviation would be permissible to uh, uh, pray in that direction and scholars say below 45 degrees so 45 is like this below that it is acceptable if it goes a little bit further then that would not be between the uh, um, acceptable parameters and hence you should uh, uh, avoid this and of course it goes without saying that you have to try your level best to uh, face the direction uh, the correct direction of the Qibla to the best of your ability Zuhair says is it permissible to enter giveaways on social media like Instagram where the rules are one you must follow the account. Two, tag three people on the post. And three, share the post on your uh, story on Instagram. Now, giveaways are giveaways. Anything that's free is wel welcome. I didn't do anything to earn it. So there is no problem in accepting gifts. The problem is the, the, the Prophet والسلام, used to accept gifts and not charity. So anyone who comes over to you and say, here, this pen is a gift, no strings attached, this is halal. There's nothing wrong in that. In this question, which Zuhair asks, he is saying that the giveaway, the gift, has strings attached to it. Number one, you have to follow the account. Number two, you have to tag three people. Number f three, you have to post it on your story in Instagram. Now, the conditions are as follow. Number one, the account has to be 100% halal. What do we mean by that? That the owner is male or a female, but never showing her photos or personal uh, things. Number two, nothing in that account endorses haram or publishes stories of haram. So it has to be an account of someone who's truly practicing Muslim. And I am astonished by so-called Muslims who claim to be practicing and on their storyline, you'll find pictures of women or a funny clip from a movie or inappropriate posts. And they claim to be practicing Muslims, maybe da'is even. May Allah protect us. This is not acceptable. So if the account holder is not a practicing Muslim or publishing inappropriate stories or posts or even pictures then participating in the whole thing is totally haram following this account is totally haram due to what is posted on it now if it is totally legit there's nothing haram it, let's assume it's an islamic account publishes only or posts only Islamic material, uh, lectures of trusted da'is, not of deviancy. Everything is totally legit. In this case, tagging three people and uh, posting that on your story in Instagram is totally permissible. And hence, taking the giveaways is permissible as well, inshallah. The last question with us is from Ahmed. He says, will angels and jinn also go to paradise as for the jinn we know that they will enter paradise 
because Allah Azza wa Jal created the jinn and the humans to worship him. And the Prophet والسلام, was sent to the jinn and to the humans as well. And Allah tells us in Surah Al-Rahman that there are the Hur al in paradise who've not been touched by neither jinn or humans, which means that the jinn and the humans will enjoy the Hur al in in paradise. So they are accountable like us humans, and they are told to pray and to fast and to perform Hajj like us, the humans. They have their own world and they will be admitted to Jannah uh, as well. As for the angels, we were not told about whether they are to be rewarded in Jannah like the humans and the jinn or not. And whatever we don't have info about, the Muslims simply refrain. We know that the angels are obedient servants of Allah that never disobey him and never go against his commands and never act out of their own will. Rather, they do exactly what they are told. And this means that they are not like us or like the jinn where we are given a test and we are told to do this or to do that and we are to be punished and tormented in hell if we disobey and we will be rewarded uh, uh, with Allah's blessings in paradise if we were to uh, comply. The angels are not tested in this fashion. They are, by their nature, obedient servants of Allah that never disobey Him. Where will they be rewarded in Jannah? This is something only Allah knows and it's not to us to discuss such issues and Allah knows best. Akbar from India. Akbar. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In concern with tahajjud, uh, two rakas of long qiyam or eight rakas of short short qiyam, is it better shape? No. So the question of Akbar is, what is more recommended, quality or quantity? Well, to abide by what the Prophet والسلام, used to observe and maintain throughout his life, is the best. And the Prophet used to pray والسلام, eight rak'ahs every night and offer three rak'ahs of witr, generally speaking. However, this is not a must. If someone finds that in one night he would like to prolong his prayer in two rak'ahs or four rather than praying eight, would we say that he's mistaken? The answer is no. Whatever he finds his heart more inclined to do and he finds his khushur and his um, uh, contemplation upon the Quran is far greater than any other way, then he should do that, especially when there is no restriction and Allah knows best. Layla from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam um, she has question is that I heard from a um, scholar that we should hide our good deed. So question is, um, if we hide it from everyone and then someone asks us that, do you do this and that? So well, what should I say? Should I lie? And if I say yes, so they appreciate and they appreciate us. So I think it's real. So what should I do? Jazakallah. First of all, good deeds are either mandatory or voluntary. So mandatory deeds such as going to the masjid or fasting Ramadan must not be hidden. On the contrary, people must know that you're doing it. So if you're going to pray Maghrib and you're walking to the masjid and someone says, hi, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to buy some groceries. And you're not lying. You're going to pray Maghrib and then buy some groceries. That is 
not a good thing to do. You have to not boast about it, but show it to the whole world that you are complying with Allah's instructions and orders, and you're going to pray in the masjid like he ordered you to do. There are other deeds that are voluntary. So if you are doing something that's voluntary, you don't go around telling people, hey, listen, I did this, I did that, I am doing this, I'm doing that. And this is similar to what Imam Malik used to do during the month of Ramadan as his sister narrated. She says that Imam Malik used to spend most of his time reciting the Quran. And whenever someone entered the room he's in, he used to cover the, the Quran with his sleeves or with his uh, uh, garment so that people would not see that he was uh, actually reading the Quran to conceal his good deeds. So yes, if you're fasting, you don't have to go around people uh, uh, saying to them, today's Monday, I'm fasting, I'm, I'm a good person. No, don't do that. But if you are asked, can you lie? Definitely not. If you're invited, someone gives you something to drink, say, Zakallah khair. Say, no, 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 come, please. It's, it's, it's on the house. It's on me. Please drink it. There's no problem saying, Zakallah khair, I'm fasting. And this is not exposing your good deeds. This is something that Islam permits. It can be a form of calling people. And it's also part of the sunnah. The Prophet says, if some of you is invited to a feast or to a meal, if he's not fasting, he should eat. And if he's fasting, he should make dua. Meaning you can attend, but say that I'm fasting and you make dua for them, that would be equivalent to answering it and Allah knows best. Raul from the US. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa barakatuh. So, Sheikh, somebody said uh, Jum'ah Mubarak to us yesterday, and then I said, you shouldn't say that. And then I then had the khutbah, he was like, wait, why should I say this and this and stuff? So I explained to him, you know, I said that uh, Jum'ah was, sorry, I said that Jum'ah was blessed at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he never said it. But they were like, so we shouldn't, or is it halal or haram? And then I showed them one of your videos on YouTube that, that, um, that you explained to them if uh, the Prophet saw something and do it, explain it, and do it. And it was like a 53 second clip. But then they're still confused. They're saying, what is an innovation? And so if the Prophet saw something and do something, we can't do it then. And so is it halal or haram? Is it recommended? Is it sunnah? So could you make it really like crystal, crystal clear for them? Please? Wallahi, yeah. akhi, I, I don't know how to make it more clearer than what I had done. I don't remember what I said in the previous videos. And this is problematic. Lots of the people ask questions on my website. And they say, Sheikh, you said so and so in a previous video. And then you said something else in a previous video. First of all, I don't open links. So I'm not going to understand what you're talking about. Second of all, I don't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. Seriously. So if I try, maybe I will find out. So I don't, I don't remember and recall what I said. And therefore, I can't revisit what I had said because I'm not a scholar. If I'm going to revisit something, I'm going to get, get it from the scholars. So what do the scholars say? The scholars say that stating Jum'ah Mubarakah every single week is not from the Sunnah. Simply because the Prophet ﷺ did not do it. The companions had never ever done it. And neither the Tabi'een nor the Tabi'at Tabi'een. It's the books are in front of us. We can see it. So if they did not congratulate one another by saying this and the need was there to be uh, cordial, to be courteous, to be kind. So they wanted to do something to feel friendly and, and brotherly, yet they did not do it. So it is suitable to say that it's not appropriate. It's not from the sunnah. And if you go a little bit further, you can say it's an innovation because it's related to a day of uh, uh, the week. It's a form of ibadah. It's related to a, a Friday and the prayer. And unfortunately, a lot of the people and maybe some students of knowledge and da'is find it easy 
and I get messages from them every single week stating Jum'a Baraka or offering the salutation upon the Prophet every Friday in a, 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 a way or sending a nasheed with the salutation upon the Prophet So I advise them, but they don't comply. So I leave them alone. So the middle path, in my opinion, is you never initiate it. You never call a cousin or a friend or an, uh, 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 someone you name and say, Assalamu alaikum, how are you doing, Akhi Jum'a Mubaraka? Never. But if people do that to you and they say Jum'a Mubaraka, you simply say, Jazakum Allah Khair. That's it. Don't reply, and it is a Mubaraka to you as well and to your family. Just say, Jazakum Allah Khair, uh, as if they had greeted you and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Ahna from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. If I make dua to Allah to guide a kafir, but I don't give any dawah to that person, if Allah accepts my dua and guides that person, will I be rewarded for every good that person does? So basically, Ahnaf's question is, I am a bit short of making da'wah to a person, but I make dua to Allah that he guides him. Why don't you uh, uh, make da'wah to him directly? I'm shy, I'm afraid, I, I have issues. Okay, so now if Allah responds to your dua and he guides him, would everything good this person does be accredited to me because I was the cause of his uh, guidance? The answer is no. You would not have anything to do with that. Firstly, because you don't know whether it's your dua that guided him or 10 other people. Secondly, most likely there were people working on the ground, giving him da'wah, giving him leaflets, uh, uh, engaging in um, conversation and, and arguments, calling him and convincing him until he complied and accepted. So you didn't do anything except dua and we do dua to all the Muslims and the non-Muslims alike throughout the whole uh, uh, year without being accredited for that good things that they do and Allah knows best. So you have to get off your uh, backside and engage in calling them to Allah Azza wa Jal directly. Uh, CD from Germany. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you, Sheikh? I'm doing well, alhamdulillah. Um, Sheikh, if a person has a problem with his recitation, not only in the signing haqqa, but also in the loud haqqa, and for him his recitation sounds so defective that it would even change the meaning, but he's also able to correct it, but with much uh, effort and by also repeating it. And this would be a burden for him. So are such people exempted from reciting correctly so that they can pray with easiness and uh, pray with um, concentration? First of all, it is mandatory upon a Muslim to learn how to recite the Quran properly, especially when it comes to Al-Fatiha especially when it comes to ensuring that the meaning does not change. And when a non-Arab tries to do this, he may find a lot of hardship, simply because there are letters that he's unable to pronounce properly. The, a lot of, even the Arabs, yani our brethren from the Arabs, they say, Salat al-Lazina an'amta alayhim. Al-Lazina. And this is problematic. They can say al-Lazina elsewhere, but when it comes to the Fatiha, due to their laziness, they don't. And this, according to the majority of scholars, when you're able to do it and you refuse to do it or you're lazy to do it, may invalidate your prayer. But for non-Arabs, it's difficult to say maghdubi, ballin. The, the, the best maybe is a dalin, maghdubi, uh, an amta, an amta. They can't say ah, an amta. So this difficulty and hardship 
it doubles their reward at the side of Allah because they're doing their level best. Now, if a person can rectify this and fix it, so if I say an amtal an amta alayhim, yes, you have to re re repeat it. But if it goes beyond recognition and he says an amta, uh, and he repeats it like six, seven times. No, this kind of hardship is overburdening him and it's too much. And Islam does not require you to do this. Do it to the best of your ability. If you're not able, move on. Nevertheless, this does not exempt you from practicing and trying your level best outside of the prayer. So you can master pronouncing these letters correctly in a couple of days, few days. If you repeat it like a thousand times a day, an'amta, an'amta, a'budu, ba'lin, you will, with repetition, improve dr uh, dramatically and drastically in Allahi Azza wa Jal. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminded us through his guidance and example that Islam is complete submission to the will of Allah. For one who submits a mere declaration or display of belief will not be taken for success, but his or her heart and soul will certainly be put to test. Allah tested the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam severely in order that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam becomes an example for his companions to follow. Similarly, he tests the believer to see whether he lives a righteous life in accordance with the instructions and commands set by Allah or lives according to what his desires dictate. Whether the faith he displays is firmly rooted in his heart or is it merely on the surface, he will be tested to see whether he will continue to have faith and love of Allah when in a calamity as he does when in comfort, whether he will continue to remember and worship him if given bounties and comforts of life as he does when he lives a modest life, Allah will undoubtedly test him to see if his faith, trust and love of him is unconditional or is it conditioned upon good health and a comfortable life free from stress and anxiety. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed us through his own example that for a righteous Muslim this life is a testing ground where he will continue to be tested until he meets Allah. For him, tests will be conducted on earth while he lives and not after he dies. He knows that as soon as death arrives and he steps into the next world, his tests are over. There, he only receives the result of his tests and enjoys the fruits of the deeds that he committed during a short span of time called life. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Brother Fauzan from Indonesia. Fauzan? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, Sheikh, I have to edit a video that contains some aura of girls for my college tests. The girls are using hijab, but not a proper one, so they expose their face, arm, and little bit of their legs. So is it permissible to do a video editing to censor their aura except their face? Or I should censor all of their aura, including the face. Is that here? And is this something that is mandatory upon you or is voluntary? 
it is mandatory for the college test for the college assignment. Okay, if, if, if this is the case, then yes, you have to conceal everything that exposes their aura. You know that the face is an issue of dispute among scholars, but the hands and the legs, there is no, the arms I mean, and, and the legs, there is no dispute upon, uh, uh, among scholars in this regard. So yes, definitely you have to edit it and conceal it. Uh, Nasra from the US. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Um, if I do something um, only because it's an obligation, would I still get the specific reward that one would get for doing such a deed? Of course. Anything that you do because you do it due to the obedience of Allah Azza wa Jal, you are rewarded for it. So why do we grow the beard? Because Allah mandated it upon us. If it's not mandated, I would have shaven it. But because I'm doing it due to the fact that it's an obligation, will Allah reward me? Most certainly. Now, if I do it because it's an obligation and I do it with compassion and love, not just because I'm afraid of Allah's punishment, but rather a little bit extra edge over that, which is I'm afraid of Allah's punishment, and at the same time, I love it because it's a sunnah and the way of the Prophet ﷺ, I would be rewarded more and more for that. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Fuad from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa barakatuh. How are you, dear Sheikh? Alhamdulillah. So Sheikh, some people have their birth certificate reduced by a few years. Yani one or two years or more than that from the actual date of birth. As a result, the companies that employ people up to a certain age, they can work up to a few extra years using the false birth certificate. So now my question is, will his income be halal in those extra years? Jazakum. Well, jazakum. First of all, it is a mistake that the individual has no power over. It's not his fault. A person is born, his parents try to make, her, make him older than the actual age so that he can work earlier, not knowing that he will be retired also earlier at the prime of his youth. So it's not your fault. It's your parents' fault. They've lied, they've cheated, and generally speaking, you cannot rectify this. Imagine me going to uh, the authorities and saying that, listen, this is my birth certificate. I am actually three years older. They say, you're lying. Prove that to us. You can't prove that to them. Therefore, legally, at the moment, you're obliged by what is documented, what's written in your uh, birth certificate and what's written in your birth certi certificate is that you are this old you can apply and your income would be halal inshallah Mustafa from Canada Assalamu alaikum Sheikh Assalamu alaikum So um, my family is uh, like they they're gonna celebrate my uh, a birthday tomorrow and um, normally when like such things happen, I just stay in my room. But I'm, I'm thinking that um, I have this one cousin who started to be like, he's coming more to Salafiyah. And I haven't told him that birthdays are haram yet. But it, if he comes, should, should, should I, what, what do you think, what would be better if I just free myself from the birthday and either stay in my room or, or go out somewhere? Or should I, when uh, my cousin comes, just... Uh, stay with him and advise him but we but we we probably be in the same place as the what the birthday is happening no first of all you have to save your own self don't care about others so you want to avoid falling into sin you want to avoid the uh, birthday celebrations and all what's uh, attached to it regardless whether this would impact other people or not this would influence negatively other people for doubting your choices or not. This is 
none of your concern. So my advice to you is invite your cousin and go out together somewhere. You don't have to uh, uh, leave him. But if this is not possible, then you leave that occasion and you can discuss this with him later on on the phone or through a visit and explain to him why you did this and Allah Azza wa knows best. Ibrahim from Germany. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu rahmatullah. I have a question about online business. So okay. if I have a product online and I want to sell it, the customer must pay through MasterCard or PayPal or bank. And all, all payment method involves RIBA. How, like, how is that? Like, for, uh, like 90 percent of the majority of the people use it in, in RIBA way. Like, for example, they pay with MasterCard, with, uh, with MasterCard, for example, and MasterCard l lends them money. So if they then didn't pay back in time, they uh, put RIBA on it. So there is a very high possibility of RIBA on the customers. If if my uh, my income is is it halal to sell sell in this way? It is totally halal. If the product is halal, it is totally halal for you to sell, regardless of the means of financing the customer is getting. I have a property. It's for sale. It costs a million dollars. My wish. So one comes and offers to buy it, I say, okay. And he goes and gets me the money through financing it or mortgaging it or whatever through a bank, through an interest-based loan. I'm not his mother. I'm not his father to say, no, 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 this is haram. You should not do that. This is his problem. I'm selling a property, which is halal. I'm getting the $1 million, which is halal, and let him do whatever he wants. This is his problem. Likewise, assuming they are buying your product through MasterCard or Visa, how do you know that they're not going to pay on time or that they're going to borrow through RIBA? This is too extreme. And it's not any of your business as a Muslim to interfere in people's lives and say, where did you get this financing? And can you show me the papers just to make sure that there is no RIBA? Okay, the next step is people want to buy products from me online, but I know that their income is not 100%. Why? Sheikh, they work in a call center and they freely mix with women. And they, whoa, 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 whoa. what are you doing? You're interfering in people's lives. Why don't you go and check whether they, when they answer the call of nature, wash themselves properly so that you ensure that they're neg not nudges. Akhi, what is this? No, this is none of your business. Your products are halal. The transaction is halal. It's their own problem where they finance it from. Naufal from Indonesia. Naufal. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam, Allah. My brother often worry about an area outside our house where we used to put our sandals off. The reason is because the sandals usually works on impurity like sewer water. He worries that the area is still impure because of that even if the area is already dry. Please your advice. So let me understand your question correctly. People walk, may walk on areas that is impure and they put their sandals before they enter and the area is dry. Your brother is worried that this is najis? No fell? Yes, sir. What I said was right? Yes, sir. Right. Okay. First of all, the Prophet ﷺ was asked about people walking over Najis areas, especially women who may drag their 
abaya, their garments, and walk over najis areas. So what would they do with that? The Prophet told them, alayhi salam, the pure areas afterwards would purify it. Meaning that if you have slippers or shoes and you step on najasa, on an impurity, then you walk on a pure land, whether it's cement, whether it's grass, whether it's soil. This area that you'd walked over purifies your shoes. And we have a legal maxim or qaida fiqhiyya kubra or a major fiqhi rule stating that certainty is not affected by doubt. Everything you see around you is pure by default. So my iPad is pure, my pen is pure, my head gear is pure. Yes, I have grandchildren. They may have touched it, may. Perhaps an impurity came, perhaps. I feel there is an impurity that came, but I feel all of these are phrases used in doubt would not impact the certainty. So if I go out of the house and I see the slippers on the ground, it's dry, I look, I don't see any traces of impurity. I cannot assume because such assumptions would not impact the certainty, which is everything is pure until proven otherwise. Therefore, tell your brother to rest assured that everything is pure, insha'Allah. Muhammad from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Yes, Muhammad. Uh, I'm apologizing first because I asked that question actually earlier, but still I wanted to, you know, ask it in uh, a little elaborate version. To say, uh, as I mentioned, you know, I work full time and I have family at kids. So making a time for me to, you know, go to uh, places to learn the Arabic language is not possible for me so i was looking for a lot of other opportunities and options so it suits me and uh, you know not that expensive i can uh, you know study so the one i feel i found uh, is you know uh, in, based on different countries like jordan and others but the instructors are for few instructors are female instructors so in that uh, situation, based on my, you know, situation, is it uh, totally not permissible at all? Okay. Basically, Muhammad sent us an email, and I answered him today. And it's good that I answered him because I was unable to understand his question until uh, um, I remembered, alhamdulillah. So his question is, he is unable to find suitable institutes that teach Arabic except a particular institute. The only problem is that the teachers are females. So is it permissible for him? Because this is the most suitable in terms of time, cost, etc. The answer is no. Learning Arabic is not a necessity. It's not an obligation. Staying away from haram is. And for a man to go to a woman to teach him Arabic, which is not a necessity, yet the possibility of falling into haram due to this sort of interaction is there, then we close the door and say, no, look, and you will definitely find other alternatives for male teachers, inshallah. Riaz Khan from India. Okay, I think we've lost Riyadh. And we have Namira from Georgia. Uh, uh, so um, uh, I read your uh, one of the answers on uh, one of your questions that um, uh, like uh, the woman should cover her eyebrows. So I'm not sure if this is like uh, when, is it like when you're going out or like in front of non-Maharams or is it like also in prayer? 
is, is the eyebrows also covered a considered a part of your hair okay first of all the issue of covering your eyebrows was directed to niqabi women so definitely a woman who is wearing the niqab she must cover everything in her face except for her eyes to expose her eyebrows this is not permissible because it's part of her beauty in salat it's totally irrelevant because she is ordered to uncover her face as long as there are no non mahram men around her so her hands and her face are to be uncovered in salat which includes of course her eyebrows so i hope this answers your question namira that this was related to wearing the niqab that a woman must cover everything on her face on her face especially her eyebrows her nose her cheekbones etc and only leave an opening for her eyes fidan from turkey or turkey assalamu alaikum sheikh wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh um so i am a bit confused about this i think i've asked this before though uh, so if someone does have like gold uh, pure gold which is let's say 90 grams and they should pay as like on it um but it's in a form of jewelry so it's like if they go and ask the price of it to know how much they should pay from the cat the person who buys and sells gold they will say higher price because the jewelry itself looks good or maybe uh it is like a brandy from some brand or maybe has some other stones on it how can one know like um the exact price of only the gold we've explained this before fidan and said that zakat is mandatory upon the gold the mineral itself the metal and silver precious stones diamonds any other thing these are not included so how do i know you take it to the jeweler's shop and they with their experience can weigh so if they weigh a hefty heavy necklace they would say that oh this weighs like 150 grams but through their experience they know that 120 grams of it is made of stones and only 30 grams is gold so they tell you there is no zakat in it even if the value of the necklace is $50,000 it doesn't matter what counts is the amount of gold in it so the jeweler's shop has this ability to uh, distinguish that drin from kosovo drin assalamu alaikum shaykh wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh uh, so my question is um, when i joined the prayer late and i i have to make up the missed raka like the third or the fourth and after imam gives salam is it mandatory for me to say allahu akbar and rise up or i just rise up and make make up the raka okay akhi drin it is important to know that every movement for the imam for the follower and for the person praying alone that he has to say takbir of course except when rising from rukur so every time you move allahu akbar sami allahu liman hamida you go for sujood allahu akbar you sit allahu akbar you uh, prostrate again allahu akbar you stand allahu akbar therefore when the imam says taslim and you have to rise for the raka this is a movement and therefore you must it's mandatory for you to stand up saying allahu akbar and if you don't say that you have dropped one of the mandatory acts of prayer if you do that intentionally your prayer is invalid and if you do that out of forgetfulness you have to compensate that by prostrating 
two prostrations before the salam when you want to conclude your prayer and Allah Azza wa knows best. Abdul Rahman from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Salam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, this is my friend's question, Sheikh. This is what? Friend's question. I, I did not understand. Sheikh, uh, I, I, the question is, I go to a school where they do bhajans every Thursday and they say Ram's name instead of good morning and before every class starts, they do something like Om for two minutes. So going to the school is permissible, Sheikh. But no, I am in 10th standard, so my parents are not letting me to leave this, this school due to education. So what should I do, Sheikh? If I understand your question, you go to a Hindu school and they impose upon you every Thursday that you engage in some sort of morning prayers that is usually practiced by doing yoga or praising Ram or saying Om and, uh, and whatever these uh, uh, kufr practices may entail. So what's the ruling on that? Number one, it is totally prohibited for you to participate. And if you're forced to participate, the best thing to do is to leave the school and do homeschooling. Or better more, go to a school that is an Islamic school. If this is not possible, then homeschooling would be your best option. If this is again not possible, you can be there but hate it with your heart and not participate in whatever they do. So be there physically but don't say or in, endorse or like what they do because you are in a kafir country and these are practicing their own religions and you must not uh, uh, join them and Allah knows best. Eve from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, I am a river to Islam and um, I got my mother and my father who are not Muslim of course. May Allah guide them. Um, they getting older and it's making me worried. Um, I don't know if the if the death would occur. My family already think that I'm kind of weird being Muslim. I don't know how my siblings would take it if I would not attend a funeral or anything of that nature. Also, the weddings are coming, and um, my brother, well, my sister, my brother, I think they're planning to get married, so I'm not sure how to tell them that I am not supposed to really attend your weddings too. So I just don't know how to break. They know I'm not celebrating Christmas or birthdays or anything like that. They're getting used to it, but I don't know how to represent them Islam, but we're not that weird. We actually, what we do is right. We've been through discussions so many times like that, but I just don't know. Don't want to be rude to them as well. I don't know what to do with the weddings or funerals or anything of that nature, especially with his family. Okay, Eve, and first of all, we don't have a say in these things. This is part of our religion and it's part of our testing. So if they're not fine with you not free mixing with your cousins, and with your uh, uh, brother-in-law, for example. If they're not fine with you wearing the hijab, if they're not fine with you not sitting with them when they're having some red wine after dinner or uh, celebrating something and drinking champagne and, a, and giving a toast, this is something that you can't help. This is part of your religion. This is the red line that we cannot cross. This is what we say, oh, you who are disbelievers, I don't worship what you worship, you don't worship what I worship, and so on. There, this is the distinction and, and the dividing line between us. So being a true Muslim, yes, you mix with them, you meet your siblings, you're happy for them to getting married, you give them advice, you uh, come every single day and say, oh, I like this uh, dress, I don't, well, within the boundaries of Sharia, ah, and give them advice how to be a good wife and to be obedient wife while giving them da'wah, etc., blah, blah, blah. 
telling them up front that with all this love you have to them, you have love greater to Allah and to your religion, which tells you not to attend such weddings. So make it clear to them. You're happy, you're giving them gifts, you're trying your level best to help, but without participation. As for the funerals, they know, your parents know that it is not permissible for us Muslims to participate in the funeral of a non-Muslim relative or a loved one. Nevertheless, I am at their bedside 24-7 trying to help them, trying to assist them, try to uh, do all what I can to serve them. But what's clear in our religion must be followed. And that is we do not participate in your funerals and we do not participate in your weddings. And you can see and tell that we love you. We are compassionate about you. We do our level best to please you and to help you and to assist you. But when it comes to our borderlines that were set by our religion, we cannot trespass or go across that. And may Allah make things easy. This is your test from Allah Azza wa Jal. Some pass, some fail to do so. I pray to Allah that he makes you among those who pass and succeed in conveying the message to them through the right channels and the right behavior, insha'Allah, Azza wa Jal. This is all the time we have until we meet tomorrow, Sunday, at 4 o'clock Mecca time. I leave you for Amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين